Good morning. The committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. Today's hearing is the first in what will likely be a long series of committee hearings related to the uh, nature, extent, and threat to America's di digital infrastructure. On May 25th, the Subcommittee on National Security and Homeland Defense and Foreign Operations held a hearing on the issue that focused on the importance of strategic public-private partnership to effectively combat the threat we face. The important work that our colleague, Mr. Chaffetz, began will continue both at the subcommittee and the full committee. His groundwork and this committee's continued focus on what spans all of government, all of the private sector, and as we know every day more of all of the world, is critical. Today, we have representatives from each of the major areas of government that are often not seen together but are critical to implementing a plan which includes an initiative by the President, a task force uh, by the Republicans, a similar effort by Democrats, and this committee on a bipartisan basis to ensure that both the House and the Senate act on the President's proposal in a timely fashion and recognize that the vulnerabilities, both public and private, which are well known, are in fact growing every day. Our vulnerability is not just because of enemies well known, but can often be because of enemies unknown, enemies who simply have a grudge against society. It is today possible to be a great warrior with nothing but your slippers in your bedroom and a desire to bring down some aspect of public or private infrastructure related to the Internet. A recent Office of Management and Budget uh, report revealed that the number of cyber incidents affecting U.S. Federal agencies shot up 39 percent in 2010. The Committee has even heard reports <coughs> that potential U.S. losses of intellectual property last year could, have, could exceed, two, or, sorry, potential losses could exceed $240 billion. Unfortunately, there is no reliable data, uh, and it is unlikely that this committee can see that, that that type of data is produced. It is clear that we will continue to have losses. Some of those losses are unavoidable. If you leave your door open, you can lose the contents of your house. But today, we are going to hear about efforts to make sure that at least in the public sector, in cooperation with private enterprise, we are attempting to provide the locks and the master key system to ensure that you have the ability to close that door if you do all that can be done. Cybersecurity is not simply for the large reports. Often the people hacked the most are small companies, companies who, don't, who are not particularly targeted but ultimately might have great losses. One of the areas of concern in the President's proposal is, in fact, the vast reporting requirements. We want to ensure that information is a two-way street and that this not simply be about a way to empower the trial lawyers to ensure that someone who doesn't report in a timely fashion, particularly a smaller company that may be somewhat unaware as to the loss, doesn't find themselves simply being victimized by a lawsuit, having been victimized by a hacker. It is important to note that cyber threats are forever changing and that cyber attacks are always adapting to get around our defenses. 
This committee is ideally suited to, to evaluate the Federal Government's strategy and ability to counter these threats by both defensive and, most importantly, potentially offensive uh, innovations. Recently, the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, stated that, in fact, cyber attacks were an act of war. War is not a defensive only measure. War is something that at times needs to have a counterattack. Practically every committee of Congress can claim jurisdiction over cybersecurity. Because of the uniquely expansive uh, nature of the threat, the strength of our Nation's commerce, utilities, transportation, banking, telecommunications, and national defense all depend on nimble response and aggressive cyber, uh, sorry, and aggressive cybersecurity infrastructure. So we claim no special jurisdiction here today, just the opposite. The Committee on Government Reform claims, in fact, to be a conduit for all committees. We will be joined by one or more individuals from other committees, and this committee will welcome other individuals to be allowed to sit on the dais and to participate in future hearings, because we view our committee as, in fact, a conduit for all committees, recognizing that any proposal, although it may well originate from this committee or pass through this committee, will also likely pass through virtually every committee of the Congress. In closing, not since the end of World War II has America seen a threat so great looming for so long. As we led up to World War II, we had plenty of warning that the Fascists were, in fact, a threat. We watched them armed. We saw them attack others. And we did little to prepare. Today we have bolstered many defenses, but let us understand there is a difference between World War II and today. We as a nation have already been attacked during my opening statement thousands of times. Attacks go on every day, and because one doesn't appear to be as large as Pearl Harbor doesn't change the fact that sooner or later America will have to respond in a more aggressive fashion to some and be better prepared defensively for others. And with that, I would uh, recognize the uh, ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you very much for holding this hearing today. In testimony before the House Intelligence Committee earlier this year, then CIA Director Leon Panetta called cybersecurity the battleground for the future. Our Nation's critical infrastructure, including power distribution, water supply, telecommunications and emergency services have become increasingly dependent on computerized information systems to manage their operations and to process, maintain and report essential information. Our government's national defense and critical information systems are also becoming increasingly reliant on information technology systems and web-based transactions and services. Successful attacks on these systems threaten our troops impair vital Federal programs and jeopardize the privacy of citizens whose personal information is maintained in government computer systems. Mr. Chairman, I have served on the Naval Academy Board of Visitors for the last 10 years, and we have recently made it a priority to change our curriculum so that every midshipman and woman uh, is required now to take defensive courses with regard to cybersecurity. In the last Congress, members of the House and Senate introduced at least 50 cybersecurity-related bills to address these issues. Given the urgency and complexity of these challenges, congressional leadership called on the administration to help develop comprehensive cybersecurity legislation. On May 12, the Obama administration issued a legislative proposal that would significantly strengthen our ability to guard against cyber attacks. I applaud the President for his leadership on this issue. And for creating a strong legislative framework to help Congress complete this important work. For example, the administration's proposal would make key changes to the Federal Information Security Management Act, FISMA, including shifting to continuous monitoring and streamlined reporting for all Federal systems. I supported similar legislation last year, and the committee successfully reported out bipartisan legislation 
that would have achieved these goals. So I am glad to see the Administration's proposal has incorporated many of the improvements included in that legislation. There are several provisions in the Administration's proposal that I would like to see strengthened. First, I hope we will consider the creation of a Senate confirmable official with authority to set administration-wide cybersecurity policy. It is important that the official responsible for implementing FISMA have the authority to task all civilian departments and agencies with implementation of the Federal security standards. The Administration's proposal also creates a framework to ensure that the Federal Government and the private industry are working together to protect our critical infrastructure. Private industry owns approximately 85 percent of the Nation's critical infrastructure, and the Administration's proposal allows critical infra infrastructure operators to develop their own frameworks for addressing cyber threats. However, while there is room for healthy debate, even industry agrees that some level of government oversight is necessary to protect the American public from the potentially devastating consequences of a cyber attack. At a recent hearing before the National Security Subcommittee, Tech America President Phil Bond testified that education and information sharing alone are inadequate to protect critical infrastructure and that the government rules, regulations and requirements are necessary to secure the Nation's critical, critical infrastructure. Other parts of the Administration's proposal attempt to help consumers and companies by creating uniform reporting standards to address cyber attacks that result in breaches of personally identifiable consumer information. However, the proposal also would allow any entity to share with DHS personally identifiable information that otherwise could not be shared under existing law. I agree that we should encourage information sharing between industry and government, but we also have to be careful that personally identifiable information is appropriately protected and shared with the government only when necessary. Finally, I agree that, that the law enforcement should have every tool necessary to go after hackers. But I am concerned that the imposition of mandatory minimum sentencing unduly interferes with judges' discretion to set appropriate penalties. I hope that future drafts of the legislation will not include this specific provision. I would like to thank Chairman Issa for agreeing to include our distinguished colleague, Congressman Jim Langerman, in our hearing today. Jim has been a leader on cybersecurity for many, many years. As he has recently highlighted, the issue of cybersecurity is not a partisan one, and I am glad that the Chairman agrees with that. But it is an issue on which Democrats and Republicans should be able to work together to come up with common sense solutions to help protect the American people. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you and the staff in a bipartisan way to, uh, to update FISMA and pass comprehensive cybersecurity legislation in this Congress. And I would ask unanimous consent that Mr. Langevin uh, be a part of this hearing today. And I would join you with you in that unanimous consent. I have served with uh, Mr. Langevin uh, on the Select Intelligence Committee, and he has always been bipartisan. Uh, hearing no objection, so ordered. We now recognize the Chairman of the Subcommittee on National Security, Mr. Chaffetz, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for your, your leadership on this issue. It is certainly one of the most in, important topics. Um, the growing cyber threat is one of the greatest national security challenges facing the United States of America. It affects nearly every facet of the private and public sector and reaches deep into our personal lives. On May 25, 2011, the Subcommittee on National Security, Homeland Defense and Foreign Operations conducted a hearing to examine the threat. Government officials testified alongside their private sector counterparts about the challenges that we face. Each gave a sobering overview of the threat, and each communicated that the threat is real, it is extremely dangerous, and it is persistent. While digital connectivity has made life more convenient, it has exposed new vulnerabilities. Our personal computers are at risk, cell phones, financial institutions, water and power infrastructure, State, local and Federal government institutions. Bad actors continually scour the Web for our most sensitive information. Social Security numbers, credit card information, bank accounts, proprietary business information, defense and intelligence secrets, plans and intentions for our political and business leaders. 
They gain this information through advanced persistent threats, social en engineering, and spear phishing. Some hacks are carried out by individual actors and small-time crooks, and other breaches are coordinated efforts by, state, by uh, foreign governments. The most devastating attacks, such as the WikiLeaks incidents, come from within. Each has the ability to inflict significant and irreparable harm. Statistics indicate that corporations lose roughly $6 million per day when sites are down because of cyber attacks. The global economy loses approximately $86 billion per year. This, there is every indication that these costs will continue to increase. The President and members of administration have publicly stated that the Federal Government is ill-prepared to mitigate the threat. The Department of Homeland Security testified, quote, we cannot be certain that our information infrastructure will remain accessible and reliable during a time of crisis, end quote. Philip Bond, the President of Tech America, testified, quote, cybercrime represents today's most prolific threat, end quote. It is no secret that the Federal Government's IT infrastructure has significant weaknesses. Across the executive branch, systems are outdated and technology is behind. Legal and regulatory frameworks are equally uh, behind. The authorities, roles and responsibilities of Federal, State, local and private entities are unclear and insufficient to meet the threat. The administration has submitted a proposal to remedy these shortfalls, and this is a good first step. However, it will continue to need examination by this committee. It will also need extensive input from the private sector, which owns roughly 85 percent of the digital infrastructure. The solutions must be effective, efficient, and allow all parties to be as nimble as the enemy. I am confident the solutions put forth by this Congress, the administration, the private sector will yield exactly the results we need to protect our critical infrastructure. As a member of the House Cybersecurity Task Force and as the Chairman of the National Security, Homeland Defense and Foreign Operations Subcommittee, I look forward to working toward an effective and efficient solution to the cyber threat. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. I appreciate their expertise and your, your willingness to be here today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee for his opening statements. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, as well as Mr. Chaffetz for uh, putting this matter on the agenda, for taking it as seriously as we have uh, in a bipartisan fashion. We are all familiar with the various incidents that have happened, including the, earlier this month when Citigroup revealed that hackers had stolen personal information from more than 200,000 credit card holders. That was one of the larger direct attacks on a major bank ever reported, but it is not singular uh, in its occurrence. Uh, thieves obtained the customer names, the card numbers, the addresses, and email information. Uh, the unfortunate part is it took the company, as it does too many companies over a month to notify all of its customers of the breach. And so that sheds some light on our need for stringent reporting requirements for breaches of personal information. Uh, it highlights the fact that banks and some other companies are focused on fraud uh, and reducing fraud, uh, but they also have to be concerned about the prevention of data theft itself on that and the, what impact it can have on the consumer. Uh, in fact, the data theft arguably is of less cost, of course, to the entities than is the uh, the fact of having the information uh, on consumers get out. So the question is where the incentives really lie in terms of making people do what they need to do to meet standards to prevent this from ever happening in the first place. So I join others in applauding the administration for creating a national data breach regulation system that will ensure that consumers, consumers learn about the data breaches as soon as possible. I applaud their efforts to encourage companies to share data about cyber attacks and the Federal Government to improve defenses against these types of attacks. When we hear about all of the incidents that are there, I think it becomes clear that we need uh, some standards. Of course, the issue then becomes if everybody doesn't adhere to those standards, how well protected are those that, that actually do? And that is the, the point where we get into it. At what point does it become too costly to adhere to the standards? And at what point, if some play and others don't, just leave everybody exposed on that? And I think that is the critical thing we would ask our witnesses to hone in on today and help us with because it is going to take an effort of everybody, uh, the companies, the, the government, you know, the consumers. We are all going to have to stay a little bit here. So we have to be careful when we start talking about immunization. Uh, I, don't, you know, I know there may be a place for it, but I am concerned that it is going to put the incentives in the wrong place and take away some incentive to really focus on the need to go after stopping these data attacks from happening in the first place and from having people comply. So I would like to hear a lot of discussion on that. I don't want to see us take the wrong approach. Uh, and sort of immunize people who then get lax and think, that, well, I don't have to play, I, I don't want to spend that money and I don't want to be responsible for it. I think we have to talk about people being accountable, particularly those that are, are going to profit from it, uh, but we have to be reasonable and understand that some places there may be a need for incentives that draws everybody in because of the expense involved. 
So I thank our witnesses for being here today and, again, the Chairman uh, for raising this issue. I would like to yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Rhode Island, uh, Mr. Langevin. I would like to thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, Chairman Issa and Ranking Member Cummings for allowing me to sit on this uh, today's hearing. And, Mr. Chairman, I have a uh, I deeply appreciate the time and attention that you and this committee have paid to this, this issue of a, as a member of both the House Armed Services Committee and the House uh, Intelligence Committee and uh, as the co-creator of the Bipartisan Cybersecurity Caucus. Uh, and as someone who has spent many years on this issue, I have a deep appreciation for the, for the challenges that we face in uh, the field of cybersecurity. And uh, I echo the comments and the concerns, Mr. Chairman, that you and the Ranking Member and others have raised today. Uh, earlier this year, uh, I introduced legislation to uh, strengthen uh, the outdated uh, Federal Information Security Management Act. Uh, this uh, language has been developed, uh, had been developed last year by my friend and former colleague, uh, Diane uh, Watson, Representative Diane Watson, uh, as well as this committee, and in fact, was, uh, this, that uh, legislation was uh, passed by this uh, committee. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to concerns over uh, earlier cost estimates, uh, we were unable to pass these uh, provisions as an amendment uh, to the fiscal year 2012 Defense Authorization Bill. However, uh, I know that members of this committee are committed to working uh, on, uh, on this problem, and I am certainly heartened to see the administration come forward uh, in this area as well. Uh, with that, again, I deeply appreciate the opportunity to join you today and look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous materials for the record. We now recognize our panel of witnesses. Mr. Greg Schaefer is the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of the National Protection and Programs Directorate of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Welcome. Mr. James A. Baker is Associate Deputy Attorney General at the Department of Justice. Welcome also. Mr. Robert J. Butler is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Cyber Policy at the U.S. Department of Defense, and Mr. Ari Schwartz is the Senior Internet Policy Advisor at the National Institute of Standards and Technology at the Department of Commerce. Welcome, all of you. Pursuant to uh, committee rules, would you please rise to take the oath? Please raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let, let the record indicate all answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. In order to allow, and some of you are returning heroes, so you know this drill, uh, enough time, your entire statements as presented will be placed in the record. We would ask you to summarize in any way you choose, but to keep it within five minutes. When you see the yellow light go on, it is not shameful to stop sooner than when the red comes on. But in all cases, please wrap up by the time the red comes on. And with that, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummins, and members of the committee. It is an honor to appear before you today. I know that the committee has already uh, had a number of hearings and briefings on uh, this topic, so I will briefly summarize uh, the current state of affairs and the impetus for the legislative proposal uh, that you have from the administration today. Um, there is no security issue facing our nation more pressing than cybersecurity. Uh, the vulnerability of our networks uh, is an issue of national security, of homeland security, and of economic security. The reality is the United States is increasingly confronted by dangerous uh, cyber environment where threats are more targeted, they are more sophisticated, they are more serious than they ever have been before. Our adversaries are stealing sensitive information and intellectual property from both government and private sector networks, compromising our competitive economic advantage and jeopardizing individual privacy. More disturbing, we also know that our adversaries are capable of targeting elements of our critical infrastructure to disrupt, dismantle, or destroy the systems upon which we depend every day. As the electric grid, the uh, major financial institutions, and mass transportation and other critical infrastructure elements attach to the networks, um, they can become vulnerable to cyber attack. This is not conjecture, it is reality. Hackers probe critical infrastructure companies on a daily basis. The status quo is simply unacceptable, and uh, we believe a solution can be found if we work together. Today's threats require engagement of our entire society, from government to the private sector to the individual citizen. 
For that reason, the administration has recently sent the legislative, a legislative proposal to Congress that focuses on clarifying cybersecurity authorities and collaborating with the private sector. Um, I will briefly talk about uh, portions of the proposal and uh, the rest of the panel will address some of the other portions. Um, with respect to protecting the Federal Government, uh, the proposal clarifies DHS's leadership role in civilian cybersecurity, consistent with the last Administration's uh, CNCI Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative proposals. First, the proposal solidifies that the Department of Homeland Security's responsibility for leading and protecting uh, Federal civilian networks and ensure that our, nation, uh, that our authorities are commensurate with our responsibilities. DHS provides a number of services to departments and agencies uh, today, and uh, sometimes the lack of clear legal authority slows us down in doing that. This proposal will clarify our legal authority. It will also modernize, uh, as noted, the Federal Information Security Management Act, or FISMA, um, to focus on continuous monitoring and operational risk reduction rather than a paper-based compliance reporting regime. Um, we believe that the transfer of the FISMA oversight responsibilities from, DA, from OMB to DHS, uh, which started um, under an OMB memorandum last year, uh, would just be solidified by the proposal, and it would enhance by consolidating the policy development, oversight, and operational expertise within one agency. Under uh, personnel authorities, uh, the proposal would give DHS the ability to attract and retain, uh, retain cybersecurity professionals in an environment that is extraordinarily competitive by extending DHS uh, to DHS, DOD's current uh, cybersecurity personnel authorities, and creating an exchange program for cybersecurity experts uh, to move between government and the private sector. Uh, to protect critical infrastructure, we have a combination of voluntary and mandatory programs to focus on public-private partnership. The administration proposal clarifies DHS's authority to provide a range of voluntary assistance uh, to a requesting private sector company or state or local government. It clarifies the type of assistance that DHS will be able to provide, including alerts and warnings, risk assessments, on-site technical support, and incident response. Organizations that suffer attacks often um, ask the Federal Government to assist, but the lack of clear statutory authority and a framework um, sometimes slows that process down, and we think that this will accelerate it. From an information sharing perspective, um, we will remove the barriers to sharing cybersecurity between industry and government. Um, it will allow uh, industry partners to share with us that which they learn from their networks um, without uh, having to go through a series of legal conversations in order to assure themselves that they are allowed to share. That will eliminate delays, sometimes of days, sometimes of weeks, um, before we can get data that can be leveraged to help the entire uh, community. Under the mandatory uh, provisions of the proposal, uh, we would leverage our, in, our, our existing and consistent uh, partnership with the private sector um, to develop uh, a, a set of uh, frameworks that would be used to reduce risk. We would work with the private sector to identify the risk. We would work with the private sector to identify the frameworks. And then the private sector would develop plans to actually implement and reduce the risk within their organizations. Um, it is a proposal that really works with industry and leverages industry's expertise uh, more uh, than thinking that the government has all the answers. Um, we look forward to working with you. This is a proposal, of course. Um, it is not the end of the discussion, but the beginning of the discussion. We look forward to working with the committee uh, on a going forward basis. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, and uh, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Department of Justice today regarding the Administration's cyber legislation proposal. Because of the short time I have this morning, rather than commenting further on the cyber threat, which, as the committee is well aware, is very serious, I will focus my remarks on two portions of the Administration's proposal that are intended to, to, intended to enhance our ability to protect the American people from cyber crime. First, data breach notification. Data breaches frequently involve the compromise of sensitive personal, uh, personal information and expose consumers to identity theft and other crimes. Right now, there are 47 different State laws requiring companies to report data breaches in different situations and through different mechanisms. The Administration's data breach proposal would replace those 47 State laws with a single national standard applicable to all entities that meet the minimum threshold as set forth in the proposal. If enacted into law, 
This proposal would better ensure that companies notify co customers promptly when sensitive, personally identifiable information is compromised, and that they inform consumers about what they can do to protect themselves. The proposal would empower the Federal Trade Commission to enforce the reporting requirements. It would also establish rules about what must be reported to law enforcement agencies when there is a significant intrusion so that, for example, the FBI and the U.S. Secret Service can work quickly to identify the culprit uh, and protect others from being victimized. The national standard would also make compliance easier for industry, we believe, which currently has the burden of operating under the patchwork of uh, the different State laws that I mentioned a moment ago. Second, the Administration's proposal includes a handful of changes to criminal laws that are aimed at, that in, aimed at ensuring that computer crimes and cyber intrusions can be investigated and punished to the, to the same extent as other similar criminal activity. A particular note, the Administration's proposal will make it clearly unlawful to damage or shut down a computer system that manages or controls a critical infrastructure and would establish minimum sentence requirements for such activities. This narrow, focused proposal is intended to provide strong deterrence to this class of very serious, potentially life-threatening crimes. Moreover, because cybercrime has become big business for organized crime groups, the Administration's proposal would make it clear that the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO, applies to computer crimes. Also, the proposal would harmonize the sentences and penalties in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act with other similar laws. For example, acts of uh, wire fraud in the United States carry a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison, but violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act involving very similar behavior carry a maximum of only five years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I look forward to your questions on this very important topic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of the committee. It truly is a pleasure to appear before you today. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Defense, uh, uh, we are aware, of course, and are working against a, a persistent threat. The DoD is reliant on a large portion of the Nation's critical infrastructure, such as power generation, transportation, telecommunications, and, of course, the defense industrial base, to defend the Nation and perform those emissions assigned to and expected of of DOD. The most important aspect of the Nation's critical infrastructure protection from our standpoint is the recognition that no one person or agency can protect the Nation from this advanced, uh, persistent threat that we have been discussing. Rather, it will require a whole-of-government approach, necessitating many different Federal agencies, State governments, private sector to work together. This legislation is an important step in that direction. It criminalizes the damage to critical infrastructure systems, breaks down barriers to information sharing so that stakeholders can communicate effectively. It engages the private sector as valuable stakeholders, and it strengthens the ability of the Department of Homeland Security to lead the executive branch in de defending the Nation against a very real cyber threat. Importantly, this legislation accomplishes all of the above while respecting the values of freedom and ensuring the protection of privacy and civil liberties that we cherish here in this country. The Department of Defense has an important role in this Nation's cybersecurity, such as protecting our military networks and national security systems, while providing support and technical assistance to the Department of Homeland Security in carrying out other protection issues regarding critical infrastructure. DOD has and will continue to work hand-in-hand -hand with Homeland Security, Commerce, Justice and the other departments, along with the private sector, in countering cyber threats and protecting our Nation's critical infrastructure. Further, the Administration's legislative proposal allows DHS to leverage DOD's practices in hiring and, pers in hiring and personnel exchange programs, as well as reinforcing the complementary and continuing defense role in providing information systems controls of defense and national security systems under the uh, Federal Information Security and Management Act. We do look forward to working with Congress to ensure the executive branch has the appropriate authorities for cybersecurity and improving the overall security and safety of our Nation. I would like to close by noting that while the work of defending the Nation is never done, this legislation will greatly help the United States Government close the gap between us and those who would want to do us harm. As I noted before, the threat is constantly uh, evolving and we must evolve to meet it. The Department of Defense is ready to play its role in meeting this challenge 
and to work with the rest of the government to protect the citizens and resources of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schwartz. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the committee, thank you for having me today to testify on behalf of the Department of Commerce on the Administration's cybersecurity legislative proposal. The main goal of this proposal is to maximize the country's effectiveness in protecting the security of key critical infrastructure networks and the systems that rely on the Internet, while also minimizing regulatory burdens on the entities that it covers and protecting the privacy and civil liberties of the public. To accomplish this balance, we focus on building transparency throughout the process and rely heavily on public-private partnerships. I will be addressing four important pieces of the proposal. First, creating security plans for covered critical infrastructure, protecting Federal systems, protecting data breach reporting, and privacy protections. One important theme of the proposal is accountability through disclosure. In requiring creation of security plans, the Administration is promoting use of private sector expertise and innovation over top-down government regulation. Importantly, the proposal only covers the core critical infrastructure as it relates to cybersecurity. DHS would define these sectors through an open public rulemaking process. The critical infrastructure entities will take the lead in developing frameworks of performance standards for mitigating identified cybersecurity risks and could ask NIST to work with them to help create security frameworks. There would be strong incentive for both industry to build effective frameworks and for DHS to improve those created by industry. The entities involved will want, to want the certainty of knowing that their approach has been approved, and the Federal Government will benefit from knowing that it will not need to invest in the resource intensive approach of developing a government mandated framework unless industry fails to act. Covered critical infrastructure firms and their executives will then have to sign off on their cybersecurity plans, subject them to performance evaluation, and disclose them in their annual reports. Rather than substituting the government's judgment for private firms, the plan holds the covered entities accountable to consumers and the market. This encourages innovation in mitigation strategies as well as improving adherence to best practices by facilitating greater transparency and public-private partnerships. The main goal is to create an institutional culture in which cybersecurity is part of everyday practice without creating a slow-moving regulatory structure. The proposal also clarifies the roles and responsibilities for setting Federal information security standards. Importantly, the Secretary of Commerce will maintain the responsibility for promulgating standards and guidelines which will continue to be developed by NIST. DHS will then use these standards as a basis for binding directives and memoranda it issues to the Federal agencies. A working partnership between Commerce, NIST, and DHS will be important to ensure that agencies receive information security requirements that are developed with the appropriate technical, operational, and policy expertise. On data breach reporting, the Administration has learned a good deal from the States selecting and augmenting those strategies and practices we feel most effective to protect security and privacy. The legislation will help build certainty and trust in the marketplace by making it easy for consumers to understand the data breach notices they receive, why they are receiving them, and as a result, they will be better able to take appropriate action. As Secretary Locke and others at the Commerce Department have heard from many companies in different industries, including a in response to our notice of inquiry last year, a nationwide standard for data breach notification will make compliance much easier for the wide range of businesses that must follow 47 different legal standards today. Finally, I would like to point out that many of the new and augmented authorities in this package are governed on, by a new privacy framework for, gov for government that we believe would enhance privacy protection for information collected by and shared with the government for cybersecurity purposes. This framework would be created in consultation with privacy and civil liberties experts and the Attorney General, subject to regular reports to Congress, and overseen by the Independent Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Government violations of this framework would be subject to both criminal and financial penalties. Thank you again for holding this important hearing, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. And I will recognize myself for the first round of questions. Uh, just a comment, Mr. Schwartz. One of the uh, challenges that I face is I am a Californian. And I know that when we harmonize a 50-state solution, it is 50 states plus California's add-on. So I look forward to working on this legislation so that it not be 49 states plus California, as it has been in, some of the, in so many other areas. Because I agree that we have to get to a interstate commerce genuine uh, compact with all states. And hopefully we can find a, a constitutional way to bind all states so that one for all and all for one law. I have a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Baker, uh, I looked through your background and I, I'm, 
you weren't here for the, the fights on, on FISA, but Mr. Tierney referred to it, and, and Mr. Schaefer, with his background, very much knows this history. When we asked communications companies to give us information after 9-11, they found themselves embroiled in lawsuits because of it. Uh, one of the challenges in the proposal is that it presumes that there will be this free flow of information one way and only one way, which is from the private sector to government, but it doesn't uh, specify the actual protections for those who give what is otherwise not their requirement to give, at least federally. Have you, have you worked out how you are going to propose keeping the plaintiff's trial bar out of the businesses each and every time something goes wrong to, for these companies that have been reporting, or if there is, in fact, effectively a leak of private information from the government that then is traced back to a private company who delivered pursuant to the vol and I understand there is a mandatory part and there is an implied immunity, but on the voluntary part. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think on the voluntary part, the, the, there is a, an immunity provision in the proposal, and that would apply to the voluntary sharing, so that if they shared the information and then somehow found themselves embroiled in a lawsuit, they could rely on that provision. And we think that is how it would come out. And at the end of the day, a judge would have to rule on whether it applied or not and if it was proper and but properly it, invoked with, and so on. But with AT&T and the others, that was exactly the problem was the Federal Government had a need to make sure that that information not be made public, and as a result, the companies were unable to properly defend themselves. So we have been down the road of, of an implied immunity versus an explicit one, and also, obviously, one of the concerns, and Mr. Tierney isn't here, but I will share perhaps what one of his concerns is, we don't want somebody to voluntarily deliver information in order to gain immunity that they otherwise wouldn't have. Have you looked at that side of the equation, not from a standpoint of a judge will decide, but that our two bodies will write it in a way in which it is predictable what the outcome would be? Yes, we, we are very aware of that concern, and, and we have tried to factor that into our thinking very much. And so that is why I think you see that the immunity provision has sort of two parts to it. One is appropriate sharing pursuant to the subtitle that would be this provision, mm -hmm. and the other is where you have a good faith belief that your sharing is, is lawful. Now, if you have a, a bad faith belief that you are sharing, you are sharing from some uh, ulterior purpose, then that would not be covered. But if you are sharing right. within the confines of the subtitle or sharing in good faith, then you would be protected. Well, having uh, Mr. Langevin and I both worked on this some time ago, having, having been there, if the government asks, one might say that if you answer, that is a good faith belief. And that is exactly where George W. Bush and his Attorney General found themselves sideways. They had clearly asked, industry had answered, and then there was a debate about whether or not that was covered. So you may want to look at that as we go through the drafting process to make sure that Effectively, if government, whatever government, thinks it is legal and they ask the question, that should be, in my opinion at least, an explicit uh, uh, immunity, because even though it is voluntary, you, we, I think we all on both sides of the dais know that a voluntary question asked by a governing body has a certain amount of, uh, of you will answer, uh, gravitas. Uh, Mr. Schaefer, uh, I guess my question to you, originally, only a few weeks ago, we thought that this was going to come out uh, as recommendations, and it came out as a proposal. Uh, is that because you felt you were closer to, uh, if you will, final legislative language, or was it simply easy to put it into this format? Because we were a little surprised when it came out in legislative format. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I can't speak to exactly uh, the decision process to uh, bring it out in this way, but I can say that uh, in the development of uh, the various pieces of the uh, proposal, um, there was legislative uh, language prepared, as obviously okay. when we uh, transmitted it, and um, the decision was made that uh, that would be the easiest way to bring those uh, ideas forward. Okay. And as I recognize the ranking member, the reason I asked that was that uh, our intention is to bring a series of private sector individuals, both in a formal fashion and in a less formal fashion, 
so that we can glean their uh, uh, input, because our understanding is this has been a government formatted and there has been no formal outreach to the private sector. Uh, and that is one of our concerns. Uh, all the opening statements talked about the 8515, that uh, our goal is to, now that this is in a, in a proposed language state, to begin communicating with uh, the stakeholders in the private sector and, and, quite frankly, also some of the State representatives. So hopefully we can uh, share in that. And I recognize the Ranking Member for his round of questioning. Thank you very much. In wake of 9-11, uh, new attention has been focused on the significance of information sharing as a matter of national security. The 9-11 Commission report says this, this is the biggest impediment to all source analysis, to a greater likelihood of connecting the dots, is the, is, <clears throat> is the human or systemic resistance to sharing information. They said something. There is widespread consensus on the need for more robust information sharing from the private sector to the government and vice versa to better protect our cyber networks and critical infrastructure. To all the panelists, how do, you, how do we overcome this systemic resistance to achieving this goal? Schaefer. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think that the proposal is designed to eliminate some of the barriers that we see uh, to information sharing. Um, one of the challenges that we have consistently uh, when an entity has information that they believe uh, the government should know and would help the broader community to protect both government and the private sector um, is they are not sure what they are allowed to share and what they are not allowed to share. They are not sure whether there is some legal provision somewhere that is going to uh, get them into hot water if they provide the information on an expedited basis uh, to the government. And uh, th this mention of it being a one-way sharing, our goal when we receive the information at DHS is to use that information and distribute the pieces that can be used to defend networks I as quickly as possible to the broadest uh, audience. So um, the provision in the proposal that provides for uh, uh, notwithstanding any other law, you can provide that information and you, you, there is an immunity for the sharing of that information if it is for a, a legitimate cybersecurity purpose, we think will enhance the ability of private sector entities to give information uh, to the government. Mr. Baker. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I think the, the key that, as Mr. Schaefer touched on, is clarity in the law. I think we need, a cl we need clearly authorize, language that clearly would authorize the sharing. We need clear limitations on, on that, in other words, privacy protections in particular. Uh, you need a clear immunity provision, as I was just discussing with the Chairman a few minutes ago. And then you also need, what, what we have heard is, clear exemptions from FOIA as well, because when uh, folks share information with the government, they become concerned that it is going to be discoverable, if you will, uh, through FOIA. So I think the, the key is clarity uh, so that they don't have to search through the Federal Code to determine uh, what provisions they may or may not be uh, violating if they were to share this information. So I think clear language that is straightforward is the, is the main objective. Now, Mr. Butler or Mr. Schwartz, do you have anything in addition to what they just said? I don't want us repeating each other. Yeah, no, I, I, I support what they what have described. Beyond the legislation, I would go back to the intent of the post-9-11 Commission. I mean, I think what we have been working on is one, building relationships. You, you saw that with the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security building MOAs, building a collaboration. Secondly, uh, planning together uh, the National Cyber Incident Response Plan. That developmental activity is really uh, enabling information sharing in new and different ways and exercising together. Uh, Cyber Watch and, and those kinds of exercises really uh, help us to build the connective tissue to enable the information sharing approach. I will just briefly say that uh, we have made really uh, large strides in terms of getting greater information sharing. I think you did a, an excellent, uh, you gave an excellent overview of all the difficulties. Um, and we tried to address some of those in sharing with government in uh, the proposal. We are certainly open to uh, broader discussions of other kinds of sharing and other ways of addressing these issues without um, unduly affecting privacy and, and other issues. You know, one of the things, I think, Mr. Butler, and some of you others may be able to answer this. In the Naval Academy, uh, you know, we made this a top priority. And in our last meeting, we were d discussing how, uh, while the Naval Academy is moving forward with, I mean, just phenomenal speed now, that we need to get this 
these, uh, this kind of um, teaching to private colleges, and we were trying to figure out how we could take the Naval Academy's curriculum and then spread it. And we were very concerned that uh, we are not preparing enough of our young people to deal with this threat. Some of you, and I am just wondering what we are doing with regard to that, because we can create all the rules we want to. But if we don't have young people, well, not just young people, but folks who are equipped to ad address this, we are, we've got major problems. I mean, we're like we've become uh, basically a defenseless uh, nation. And so you all are pointing out how urgent the, the situation is. But what are we doing in that regard? Just from the from the DoD perspective. Um, Secretary Gates made it a top priority in terms of next-gen workforce education for defense and the national security base. So it is the academies of certainly Annapolis and the other academies. We have a fairly large program through uh, the Department of Defense on information assurance, which reaches colleges around the United States, uh, working with them on curriculum development as well as internships and scholarships for, for uh, students. We, we build on that with the Cyber Patriot program, uh, where we are involved with uh, high school students, junior high students. Uh, we, we support the National uh, Cyber Collegiate Defense Competitions. More than competitions, they are actually coaching and mentoring programs. They are continuous uh, education outreach programs to allow us to uh, help young people understand what we are faced with and actually kind of cast a dream for them to get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, uh, I will uh, now recognize myself for, for five minutes. Um, one of the emergency national security concerns is that you have software, infrastructure, uh, hardware, other things that are built overseas that come to the United States with um, uh, items that are embedded already in them by the time they get here to the United States. Um, this poses, obviously, security and intellectual property risks. What, A, is this happening, Mr. Schaefer, and B, uh, what are we going to do to, to fight back against this? Uh, thank you, sir. The, uh, clearly, supply chain risk management is an issue that the administration is focused on, that uh, Homeland Security working with uh, partners uh, at the table. And, and, how, and how, how are they focused on it? I mean, is this happening? Uh, so is this happening? Whether or not um, there are specific examples of insertions uh, is something I would rather talk about in a I know you would rather not. It is just a yes or no question. Is this happening or not? Um, we believe that there are, is significant risk in the area of supply chain. Is it happening to the best of your knowledge? I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, thought I, I thought I threw you a softball to no, begin with here. No, no, thank, Is this happening or not? Thank you. I, I missed the very beginning of the question in the wording that you gave me, and I, I apologize. I don't want to get this wrong. Um, can you rephrase for me? Are, there any, are you aware of any component software, hardware coming to the United States of America that are already embedded, that have, have security risks already embedded into those, those components? Uh, I am aware that there have been instances where that has happened. Okay. So what are you doing? What is Homeland Security doing about What can we do about this? This is one of the most complicated and difficult challenges that we have. Um, the, the range of issues goes to uh, the fact that there are foreign uh, components in many U.S. manufactured devices. Yes. There are U.S. That's components. the obvious. Keep there going. Are US Go components. faster. I've only got five minutes here. Yes. I, I, there I, are I, many foreign components in our materials. A, yes, I a, got it. There is a task force that DHS and DOD co chair uh, to look at these issues with goals to identify short term uh, mitigation strategies and to also make sure that we have capability. Uh, for maintaining U.S. manufacturing capability over the long term uh, and, and are in a position to ensure that the critical infrastructure pieces have what we All right. Let, let me go to a second one. It is terribly complicated. I understand it is difficult. But the concern is that it is happening, and it is probably happening on a more frequently, frequent basis than most people recognize, that these things are embedded in devices and software, and people don't know that. And it is very difficult to detect. Let, let, let me move on and, and stick with you, Mr. Schaefer, on this. There is a lot of discussion here about private to public having to report to the government. How much did the government, the White House, uh, Homeland Security and others, did they work with the private sector? I mean, the, the numbers are pretty 
pretty big. The upwards of 85 percent of the infrastructure that is used is from the private sector. The networks that are used are run by the private sector. But there is a lot of concern that the private sector really wasn't at the table when this, this uh, was developed. Were they at the table, and, and how much so? So with respect to the, the proposal that you have before you, as we yeah. said, we think this is the beginning of the conversation. It was developed and informed by our long-term and existing relationships with the private sector. Frankly, I have spent the vast majority of my career in the private sector working as a chief information security officer and as a consultant to large corporations. Um, we built this proposal based on what we have learned through the National Infrastructure Protection Plan process, um, our relationships with each of the sectors, the sector coordinating councils, the ISACs and others. I believe that this proposal is designed to give the private sector tremendous input into the process, both in identifying the risks, identifying the frameworks, building their own plans. This doesn't prescribe specific technologies they need to use. It doesn't give them a mandate to do this in any certain way. It gives them an opportunity to participate in developing a regime that will allow us to uh, reduce risk. Mr. And, and, Chair Mr. Chairman, just briefly, um, the, the Department of Commerce actually had a notice of inquiry last summer that addressed many of the pieces that are now in this legislative proposal that did inform, that were informed by input from the private sector. So while we agree that at the beginning there was some informed piece that, was, that came from this. Uh, and I guess one of the concerns I have moving forward, one of the, uh, for further discussion, uh, one of the shortcomings I see is that it is not, um, it, how do we take it from the public realm and inform the private sector? It seems to be very much a one-way street. It needs to be back and forth. I see you are all shaking your heads. I, I hope there is concurrence on this. We will have to work on the specific language and how that information would flow, because it does need to be uh, communicated back and forth in a, in a two-way. I have lots more questions, but my time is expiring. So uh, with that, we will now recognize uh, the, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjardins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, a growing threat to both the public and private sector information systems are cyber attacks from foreign governments or organizations closely aligned with them. And uh, cyber attacks certainly are not exclusive to the United States. Other countries have experienced such attacks. At what point do cyber attacks carried out by foreign governments become an act of war or what uh, some refer to as cyber warfare, war, cyber warfare against another nation? And I'll just open that whoever wants it. Uh, thank you, sir. So I think uh, that's a, that is a legally difficult question to answer. But certainly, acts that would that would be equivalent uh, in their effects to a kinetic attack on the United States would fall within the category I think that that you're talking about there. So if the so I think if you look at the effects and it were equivalent to a kinetic attack, that would be a, an act of war. Or no. Have we developed any? Um, effective means of identifying who the actors or players in these attacks are? Attribution is very, is a, is very difficult in this area. That, that is challenging. It, it doesn't mean it can't be done, but it is challenging. I defer to my colleagues if they want to add something on that. Okay. We continue to evolve with the technology to help us with attribution and the tactics, techniques and procedures. Uh, but right now it is a fairly intensive forensics analysis process that we go through to to attribute to actors. Okay. Uh, both public and private sectors are deeply interwoven and dependent upon each other for their operations and functionality. Um, you know, for example, telecommunication and transportation are heavily dependent on the power grid for operation and vice versa. Does our current Internet or communications infrastructure have enough redundancy built into it to ensure that we could survive a catastrophic attack on its physical or technical assets? Sir, if I may, uh, there have been uh, numerous attempts to look at that question uh, through uh, risk analysis by uh, various sectors, including uh, the IT sector, the comm sector. Um, and the belief is that there is a significant amount of resiliency within uh, the network. Certainly the Internet was built with resiliency in mind and the ability to route around various types of problems. Um, 
on any given day with any uh, particular kind of attack, it is hard to say whether you will have enough resiliency in that particular place. Um, but I do think that the architecture of the system is uh, designed to be quite resilient. There are certain pieces of the puzzle that obviously need more security, and that is, uh, I think, where we are with the legislative proposal today. Okay. Does the Federal Government have an effective defensive posture to ensure that attacks on private sector networks or infrastructure can be isolated uh, with little damage to its own assets? I would say that we are uh, very much, uh, both industry and government, dependent on one another in a variety of ways. It, is, uh, it would be very difficult to isolate uh, the government uh, from the critical infrastructure uh, pieces that are provided by industry. And as has been noted, they own a substantial portion of that infrastructure. There have been a number of economic estimates regarding the cost of a major cyber attack on the economy. Are there consistent, reliable numbers that tell us how much cyber crime or cyber attacks cost the United States each year? There, there are uh, a wide range of estimates. I don't know that there is a single consistent across-the-board uh, way to estimate what those costs would be. Um, what we have seen over the course of the last several years is uh, we are attaching more and more of our critical infrastructure uh, to the Internet for the efficiencies that it can bring. That, of course, uh, adds to the potential uh, for damage if those systems are compromised. But I am not aware of a single metric uh, that can be used to identify how much damage is uh, within the art of the possible. Okay. Um, where are the most significant weaknesses in our IT supply chain? I don't mean to pick on you, Mr. Schaefer. <laughs> Quite all right. Um, uh, I, I don't know that I could identify the most uh, significant weaknesses within the supply chain. As I said, the, the supply chain uh, issues are, are increasingly complex uh, because we do have a global economy in which our uh, uh, products and, uh, and equipment is installed and embedded in uh, foreign product, foreign product is installed and embedded in our product, and the need to have appropriate processes um, to address risk and manage to uh, ways of identifying where there might have been a compromise to the system is what we focus on in terms of programmatics at the Department. Okay. Thank you. And thank you all. I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. I will now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Donnelly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to the panel. Um, and I certainly agree that cybersecurity is perhaps the largest single growing threat both to American infrastructure and to national security. Uh, the number of, of incidents, cybersecurity incidents reported by Federal agencies to U.S. CERT has increased from 5,000 to 41,000 over the last five years. And one of the th concerns I have got is that uh, when we had hearings on this subject a few years ago in this committee, we, we got, took testimony from a lot of Federal agency heads, and they focused on the part of FISMA that requires education and training and awareness. And they could check off that box and say 80 percent of our workforce is trained. But when you ask the question, but are threats going up or down? They are going up, of course. And are successful hacking attempts or cybersecurity threats going up or down? That also is going up. So I guess I would ask first, Mr. Schaefer and anyone else on the panel, are we measuring the right I mean, are, are we really working with the right metrics here on the subject of cybersecurity with Federal agencies, uh, or are we measuring the easy to measure? And then secondly, what kind of uniformity is there across dozens of Federal agencies to take the proper measure to protect the systems in place, understanding the differentiation among those agencies? Uh, th thank you for the question, sir. Indeed, uh, the reason that you see the proposal uh, in this uh, legislative proposal around FISMA is we recognize that there needs to be a change in the way FISMA works. Um, even without uh, the legislation in place, we have taken an approach that is much more aggressive since uh, the Department has been asked uh, to, to take on more responsibility in the space. And so we are meeting with the Department uh, CIOs uh, to sit down and walk through all of the various requirements, not just the training requirements, but all of the requirements that currently uh, exist, and talk about how to prioritize those things that really matter and that will reduce operational risk. Um, 
our approach is to get to continuous monitoring so we aren't reporting annually with a piece of paper what's happening on someone's network, which, as you know, is outdated before the paper is written, um, but are seeing what is happening on those networks, can correlate that data with what we're seeing from our intrusion detection and intrusion prevention technology at DHS, and uh, actually uh, work with the departments and agencies to reduce the risk that they are seeing uh, in terms of the kind of attack experience that they have on a daily basis. Sir, these are you asked um, very good and extremely important questions. I think that for I hope the chairman heard that. <laughs> so, uh, the very good and extremely important question. The, uh, uh, I think that the, in terms of what we're measuring, um, one of the, th the main problems that we've seen is that the inspectors general have looked at at this, the controls that have been put in place as a checklist rather than trying to get at. The, the main set of problems that are out there. So one of the things that we try to do in, our, in, the, in the administration proposal is to provide more flexibility in the structure so that the Inspector General will look at what is important for that particular agency. Um, at the same time, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Schaefer suggested, we try to increase the automation through continuous monitoring through other means so that we have a, a better standard across, the team, that, uh, across uh, the, the, all different agencies. That doesn't mean we can stop other means of uh, looking at the, the, the best practices and the controls that are in place, um, but, but we do need to uh, do a better job of making sure that we have the right controls for the right agency. We think that the administration proposal does that for in, with, with uh, changes to FISMA. I would just add that I, I, what we see in the Department of Defense, I think it re, it's reflective of, uh, of our general sense of where we need to go with metrics. Um, we look at technology, tactics, techniques, and procedures and people in an integrated way. And so as we work to harden networks and, and improve our cyber hygiene practices, we also look at proactive defense measures that we can continue to incorporate in those areas. Um, continuous red teaming, pen testing against what we are doing helps us to update the, the metrics. And, we, and as we have stood up, you know, organizational structures like Cyber Command and others, we, we are moving more and more towards what others are talking about with a, a continuous monitoring mode that builds beyond FISMA and helps us to, uh, to ensure you know, what anomalies we are missing that potentially could be problems down the road. Is there a mechanism within the Federal Government for exchanging um, best practices, experiences, tapping into the private sector expertise and the like? Is there some kind of form, formal or informal, that does that? Actually, there is, sir. Uh, one of the things that DHS sponsors is something called the Cross-Sector Cybersecurity Working Group. Um, this represents the uh, critical infrastructure, 18-sector uh, cybersecurity resources and gives them an opportunity to work together um, to bring the knowledge that one sector may have learned uh, to the other sectors. It is one of the goals of the program uh, to make sure that wherever we see an issue, we can get that information out to the entire community. Mr. Chairman, I know my time is up, but I, I think that is a very important point. We want to break down the stovepipes here so that we are sharing experience and intelligence across agencies to try to deter the threat. Thank you very much. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize the gentleman for Texas for five minutes, Mr. Parenthal. Thank you very much. Um, I guess, Mr. Schaefer, I think you use the term you are seeing attacks every single day. Earlier we are talking 41,000 uh, attacks uh, reported uh, to CERT. We've got a very, we, we see this growing at, at an incredible rate. I've, I'm very much afraid that we've got a problem here that is going to be very difficult and very uh, expensive to fix, uh, both within the government and in the private sector. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong here. We've got a wide variety of threats coming everywhere. You got nation states as possible offenders, terrorists, criminals, uh, industrial espionage. Uh, I guess we call them hobby hackers. Uh, I mean, there's a wide variety of uh, people intruding uh, into computer systems. I don't think a day goes by that I don't have to install some sort of security update uh, on on my computer. So uh, I guess my question is. We, we, I guess we need to take a multi-tiered approach. Where do you see the focus needing to be? Do, you need, do we need to be focusing more on hardening systems to attack? Do we need to be uh, focusing on prosecutions? Where is the balance there where we are going to get uh, the most bang for the buck? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. Frankly, I think we need to do it all. 
Um, there is a, uh, this is not a single solution uh, problem. It is not a problem that can be solved by any one entity. It can't be solved by government alone. It can't be solved by industry alone. It can't be solved by a single technology. Um, this is going to take a whole of government effort. It is going to take a whole of uh, society effort, right down to individuals who need to apply the patches and the virus updates to their machines. The ecosystem was built in a way that allowed us to take advantage of moving very fast, um, but the security pieces have been, uh, for the large measure, bolted on after the fact. And we are uh, we're trying now to uh, fix those issues, uh, but I do think it is going to require us to build better perimeters, uh, apply those patches everywhere on all of the systems, uh, update those systems to the best technology, and, and do this vigilantly in all uh, cases. All right, well, I'm gonna, I guess I will open this up to the rest of the panel. I don't know who might be the expert on this or if anybody has any ideas. Does anybody have any clue what this gonna, is going to cost in some reasonable term that we can understand? So the price of a computer now is $500 of average piece of software, is, you know, depending on what it is. I mean, how much percentage-wise, how much is it going to raise the cost okay. of computing to do this? I, 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 while I can't say how much it will cost to do this, what I think has been said repeatedly is how much it is costing us for not having done it. Um, the cost to our society, all that we are spending on uh, trying to chase this problem, deal with the intrusions when they occur, the intellectual property loss that is going to hit us in terms of our economic competitiveness at a later point in time, um, those costs are also very hard to estimate, but we know they are large. And, and where, do you, where do you balance it between what the government spends and what the private sector spends in, in businesses and what I have to spend uh, you know, in order to surf the Internet at home? Now, I, I think what this proposal uh, does that we have never had before um, is a way to design for critical infrastructure a, a regime that actually allows uh, for a standard of care to be developed, for clear frameworks uh, to be laid out that industry agrees with, they understand the risks, they know what they need to do in order to meet those risks and uh, make them go down. And if we do that, I think the markets will develop to produce the products that will make that easier and less expensive if everybody is working to that end. All right. Now, I have only got a minute left, and I, want, I wanted to hit on one other topic, and again, I will open this up. What I, I'm deeply concerned that as you see increased cooperation between the government and, uh, and the private sector, that my data that is stored out in the cloud uh, becomes accessible to the government and either by accident or through some sort of uh, fishing expedition, uh, what I would consider to be my private communications uh, are accessible to the government or worse yet become public. Uh, how are we addressing those concerns? Uh, thank you, Congressman. So uh, we have to make sure, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we have to make sure that we have clear and understandable laws in place to protect the legitimate privacy expectations of Americans. We absolutely want that to happen. There are a range of different laws today that protect your privacy. And so uh, we, whatever we do, we need to make sure that we address all of those sort of holistically, if you will, uh, because you know, the, the, the different types of data are protected under different regimes. And uh, we need to make sure that we do this in a, in a smart way. But we're, there are a variety of laws that are implicated, and we have to take a look closely at all of those. All right. Well, well I am out of time. Thank you all very much. I think we will now uh, recognize the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, there are uh, private sector organizations that exist today that are working to help private industry protect against these cyber threats. And, you know, the estimate is about 80 percent of our cyber threats, security and critical infrastructures through the private sector. For example, many of the critical infrastructures have organizations within which companies can share threat information and best practices. And as the government should always be looking to these organizations to assist in the effort to protect the country. Do you currently work with any private sector organizations to facilitate the threat information sharing and best security practices? And if you do, can you tell me which organizations are you working with? Thank you, Congressman. Um, indeed, the Department of Homeland Security is working with many private sector organizations in an effort uh, to share best practices, uh, share information about threats and vulnerabilities. Um, we work uh, through, again, the sector coordinating councils 
um, under the National Infrastructure Protection Plan. We work with the ISAC organizations, the Information Security and Analysis Centers uh, for the various sectors, including the financial services sector, uh, the multi-state ISAC, which goes to state and local governments, um, the IT uh, ISAC. Um, representatives from the communications sector, all of those uh, ISAC organizations we work with. Not only do we work with them, but we have been working to integrate them into our process on the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center watch floor. So we actually have representatives from many of the sectors who are either on or coming on to the floor and will participate in the National Cybersecurity uh, uh, the Incident Response Plan. Uh, processes to address issues when they occur. So we are we are working extensively with private sector organizations. We can certainly get you a full list if uh, if you'd like after uh, the hearing. Okay. Does anybody else want to add anything to that? Or? Well, NIST is designed to work very closely with uh, with a range of private sector players, including the standards development organizations, ANSI, and and the wide range of other uh, other private sector standard setting organizations, and take the the standards best practices. Um, from their side to take the standards and practices from the uh, government side and develop those uh, in, to do the work th within the f Federal Government and vice versa. A lot of the standards that are developed within the Federal Government are then taken uh, into the private sector and, and free and open for them to use as well. So uh, w we have a very good, good, strong relationship. And again, we could take back and, and get you a full list if you would like to see that. Right, thank you. Uh, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say. Uh, just building on, I mean, it, it, for for the Department of Defense, it's it's consulting, its services and products, uh, heavily engaged with uh, a lot of different security firms with regards to ensuring that we have the latest and greatest products installed. Um, HBSS is an example as we kind of uh, work through the uh, WikiLeaks mitigation, but continuous uh, uh, efforts working with them on threat mitigation. Just real quick, a, a significant amount of information sharing goes on as well with respect to uh, law enforcement agencies, a back and forth. Obviously, when you have a, a crime that's occurred, you have information sharing that goes on there. But in other forums, law enforcement agencies, FBI, U.S. Secret Service are working regularly to, to make sure that this information is shared back and forth. Okay, I have one more question. Uh, while protecting ourselves from cyber attacks, is, we know it is extremely critical. Many private industry uh, individuals have witnessed a pro proliferation of Federal initiatives dedicated to this issue. For example, there are over 25 different working groups or task forces being led by the Federal Government. Is there any analysis going on right now conducted that would provide ways to streamline this activity to avoid duplicative spending and minimize the amount of Federal do dollars spent? I think we are continually looking, uh, Congressman, at ways to uh, coordinate our activity and make sure that the groups that we are working with um, are uh, focused on uh, different problems and are bringing to the table not duplicative but uh, complementary uh, sets of information. And so uh, I, I know within DHS uh, we have several groups that do have uh, overlapping jurisdiction, if you will. They have got some of the same members, but we have got them focused on different pieces of the uh, elephant that is the cybersecurity problem. And so we are working that uh, to try to coordinate and make sure that we are not uh, introducing a lot of redundancy. Sir, we haven't been afraid to close down uh, working groups that are, have outlived their uh, time. Uh, everyone that's working on this issue, it's a huge issue. Everyone that's working on it has many meetings to go to for many of the different task force, and, and the fewer of them that we can have is a benefit. And I think there has been some leadership in that regard in terms of trying to um, work through a problem, cut it off, and, and move on when we can do that. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panel for uh, their testimony here today. Um, I just want to return to an issue that I raised in my, uh, my opening comments. Um, some members have, uh, have, suggested, have, uh, have objected to uh, updating our, our Federal cyber uh, readiness due to potentially large upfront costs, yet undoubtedly these efforts will save billions of dollars in efficiencies. Uh, while providing long uh, overdue cyber uh, protections and integrity to our Federal networks. Now, this question would be, I think, more appropriate for uh, an entity with a, with a top-line view of our, our cyber efforts across all government agencies, such as um, the cyber director that, that I have proposed. However, since the Administration's current uh, cyber uh, coordinator lacks this authority and as DHS is taking on uh, the operational lead on these efforts, 
Uh, I'm going to pose the, the first question to Mr. Schaefer and uh, then uh, to the rest of the panel. Um, Mr. Schaefer, what is your assessment of the costs required to carry out the Administration's plans to move uh, to an IT infrastructure based on continuous monitoring uh, and automated reporting that was proposed uh, by the Administration in its uh, legislative proposal? And what efforts have already been implemented? And, uh, and what are your uh, projected uh, estimates on cost savings and efficiencies and security as a result uh, of these updates? Thank you, sir. Um, I think the key to the FISMA reform uh, proposals is that we recognize that much of the work and effort and spending that is done today uh, to meet the FISMA requirements that are really compliance-oriented, check-the-box kind of exercises with a, an annual report um, can be repurposed in a way that allows us to actually buy down risk through the continuous monitoring and other solutions that um, are being proposed. And the work that we are doing uh, with the departments and agencies on a general basis to improve cybersecurity across the board uh, can uh, also be done in a way that will get us to better FISMA compliance. So I can't give you a, a dollar figure with respect to how much um, it will cost, but I can tell you that we believe that over the long run, um, if this is done and the uh, security is improved as dramatically as we think it can be, um, the expense associated with all the work we do to chase the problems and uh, to address all of the intrusion activity that is happening uh, will be reduced. And so net-net, uh, I think we will have a positive result over the long run. And once we start building security into everything that we are doing, um, there is consistent uh, data that suggests that building it in is much cheaper than bolting it on. Okay. And it, to the other parts of my question, though, uh, what efforts have already been implemented and, and what are your uh, projected cost savings uh, on uh, the efficiencies and security as a result of, of the updates? Sir, we are certainly happy to, uh, to work with you to think about how to score this. Um, I, I don't have any numbers that I can present uh, today with respect to uh, estimates of what the actual savings would be. Um, again, we know that this is a, uh, a uh, beginning of a conversation and a proposal, and we expect that uh, the final uh, result um, may or may not look exactly the way we are now, but we, we would certainly want to work with you and with the committee uh, as we think about what the uh, cost estimates will be. Okay. Let, let me move on to another question. That, um, I've noticed that uh, one element left out of the legislative proposal uh, was, a strong, was a strength in White House office with budgetary authority uh, and Senate confirmation. And uh, this is something I feel strongly about. But uh, in fact, just last year, the, the White House moved very further away from uh, this model by moving uh, OMB's uh, oversight for the Federal security uh, to, uh, to DHS. And while DHS clearly uh, is the operational lead or has the operational lead for uh, protecting the .gov network, what authority do they have to oversee uh, agency budgets and actually compel these important technical uh, challenges to actually be addressed? Obviously, various departments and agencies, their mission, uh, you're looking at State or, or Congress, isn't necessarily uh, the security of our .gov networks. And so how do we actually compel, compel compliance? I mean, uh, uh, OMB could do it, uh, but does DHS have that, that sufficient authority? Because I, I really question that. And, and also I'd like to know why was a strength in White House office not considered? Um, in, in the Dele uh, in the delegation of authority from OMB to DHS to undertake the work that we are now doing on, uh, on FISMA, um, OMB retained the budget authority um, to uh, effectively be the entity that enforces uh, the, those requirements uh, from a budgetary perspective. Um, DHS, as you, you point out, has the operational responsibility. Um, the, the legislative proposal would consolidate the oversight responsibility with um, the operational responsibility that we have and move things in a direction where we would be given the authority uh, to direct departments and agencies to take action uh, to improve their security and, and deploy appropriate uh, protection. So um, with respect to today, you have got a, a dual arrangement where DHS has the operational responsibility and OMB has the budget responsibility. Uh, that is the way it would line out, sir, I think, today. But I know my time has expired, but you know, maybe for the record, I would like to get an answer to the question of why uh, a Strength and White House office wasn't, uh, wasn't considered. I yield back. Thank you. 
Thank you. I now recognize myself for, for five minutes. Um, Mr. Schaefer, according to press reports, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has rejected the legislative proposal as, quote, regulatory overreach, end quote. Uh, we found uh, an internal chamber document that revealed that the chamber believed, quote, layering new regulations on critical infrastructure will harm public-private partnerships, cost industry substantial sums, and not necessarily improve national security, end quote. The question becomes, and, and their, their general concern is that it is overly broad. How do, you, how do you respond to that, and, and how involved is the chamber in these types of discussions? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I believe that this proposal is carefully crafted to give industry a strong voice in designing the solution set. So it is hard to understand um, the suggestion that it will be overly expensive or overreaching when, in fact, industry will have an opportunity to say what the threats are that need to be mitigated, um, what the uh, frameworks should be in order to address those risks, and then develop their own plans um, in order to meet those frameworks. Uh, but, but part of this proposal calls for a Homeland Security to be authorized to publicly name critical infrastructure providers whose plans you deem to be inadequate and then publish those. How, how is that going to help protect them? At the transparency uh, at the end of the day will engage market forces, we believe, in order to drive towards better results. We wouldn't be publishing. So you are going to go out and tell the world. Here's the, here are the weakest of the week. Is that what your the plan is? The proposal would provide summaries of the plans and summaries of the evaluations. It is not as if all of these entities aren't under attack today, and uh, if they are weak, in fact, the adversaries are taking advantage of them. So the proposal here is to make sure that not just the adversaries know they were they are weak but, in fact, the public knows and the markets can take appropriate action. And so which of these companies would be required to report to the SEC, for instance, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, and have their plan certified as sufficient? How does that work? So those who are already uh, subject to SEC reporting requirements would be required to include this information in uh, that reporting. Um, the proposal doesn't include any suggestion that others would be required to come into that kind of reporting. Uh, I have a lot more questions about that, but given the time, uh, I want to go to one other quick subject, and, and let's focus maybe with Mr. Butler, Mr. Baker here. Uh, obviously, a lot of these concerns come from overseas players. Uh, we're a little bit outside of our reach, but increasing penalties. How, how do you, how do we highlight in these concerns? Like, if somebody walked in to a computer and physically blew it up, it would be, you know, national news. It would be a big deal. Somebody comes in through the back door electronically and is blowing up or destroying or stealing information from the computers. Nothing seems to happen. Nobody seems to know. Um, how, how do we expose this and how, what kind of penalties can we possibly put in place? Mr. Chairman, so the, the issue is making sure that we have the penalties in place that we then can go and try to enforce. So the enforcement part, I agree with you, is a separate question and a separate thing we need to deal with. And we deal with that through a variety of different ways, principally through appropriations, frankly, to make sure we have enough people who are skilled in this area to go out and do this around but, the world. But how does that work on the international stage, when you have somebody who is in some other country doing this? Yeah, internationally, I mean, the FBI, U.S. Secret Service are, in great, are engaged every day in working with their international partners to bring these kinds of people to justice. And I think over the past. But how many of them are actual state actors? I mean, you got some kid in a van down by the river, I'm sure, in some other country doing this stuff. But you also have very uh, concerted efforts from state sponsors. What are we doing about that? I guess on the state sponsors, I think I will defer to DOD on that one. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in May, the, the uh, White House issued the International Cyberspace Strategy. Um, the International Cyberspace Strategy begins to lay out principles and norms that will guide our efforts as we try to engage on this problem that you have highlighted. Uh, one, of, one of the ideas is to, is to work with nations to determine, you know, what is going on inside of, you know, their sovereign territory and like-minded folks getting together to figure out what we need to do so we can not only share information but actually uh, No, I, my specific question is, please. when you know it is an actual country, a state, what are we doing about that? I mean, how, how do you, if somebody were to fire upon us, uh, I would think we would be 
we would be outraged. But if they seem to do it as a cyber attack, it seems to be you know, kind of quietly pushed under the rug because we don't want to be embarrassed. So, so again, I will go back to the international cyberspace strategy for a moment. Uh, we say in that document that uh, as we look at cyber incidences and, and we deem that potentially uh, this is something more malicious and that uh, as we work through attribution, we reserve the right to respond. Uh, and that is through a variety of means. Those include law enforcement means, diplomatic means, and what have you. We are just at the beginning of, of now moving from that declaratory position to now considering what the policy priorities and how we will I will go ahead. And well, obviously, obviously we are going to have to explore this in greater detail. We, we know that it is happening on all levels, in all forms, and it is one of the biggest threats to the United States of America. Mm -hmm. um, if there aren't any other questions from any other members, I, uh, I, yes, uh, Ranking Member. Very quickly, I'm going to, I just want to thank you all, but I also want to remind you, just add, uh, piggybacking on what Mr. Chavis just said, you know, on 9-11, which should be seared into all of our memories, which I know it is. You know, they, 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 the terrorists were trying to send a message, several messages, and one of them was the disruption of our way of life. And when you think about terrorists, and you know, and now that we've um, killed Osama bin Laden, but when you think about trying to figure out ways to bring harm to the United States, you know, and everybody is saying, well, how are they going to do it next? How are they going to try to do it? You know, somebody can actually sit at a computer and do all kinds of harm. And so I'm just, you know, I just, I, I'm just, I, I can hear from you all that we are dealing with this, in the words of the President, with the urgency of now, because it is extremely urgent. And I hope that we will move this along as rapidly as possible. And again, I want to thank you for all you are doing. Thank you. I, I also want to echo and thank you for your work, your dedication and commitment. This is a very difficult and challenging question. It is something that is incredibly nimble. It continues to evolve and change. There is no end to the creativity that terrorists and others who wish harm and, and uh, uh, harm to the United States of America will act. Uh, we don't want to have another major, major incident where what someday we wake up in some major portion of our infrastructure. Or, or, or whether it be private or public, um, this has got to have a lot more attention uh, and uh, uh, placed upon it. We, we certainly don't want to have the kind of incident that we would all, all regret, knowing that we could do everything we can to help prevent it. At the same time, I think we also need to recognize that we need to preserve people's individual liberties. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't overstep and overreach into what private companies are doing. Uh, and finding that right balance will be one of the challenges for this Congress and future Congresses as well. But we will do so, I hope, in a, in a very bipartisan way. We thank you for your expertise. We thank you for being here today. Uh, the committee stands adjourned.